The Datavana podcast, hosted by Lon Wax, features visionaries, leaders, and really smart people who join our hosts to converse about marketing, sales, operations, and everything that data ties together. We focus on practical examples, stories, and horror stories centering around what Data Nirvana looks like and what the path is to achieve it. All right. So welcome to another exciting chapter of the Data Nirvana podcast. So Megan, tell we talked a lot about data, right? So data to you, what does it mean? What, why is data so important? And wh- what is actually the complexity and the look and like really focusing on data? What does it mean to you? Wh- what are you guys doing about it? Well, without data, you can't make decisions. Um, and especially at the scale that MongoDB is at, you know, we we need data to inform, you know, how which accounts are we going to target? Where are we going to put reps? Um, how are we going to segment? Um, all those decisions are reliant on data. And, you know, what I found is that, you know, the, the you know, your, your data is going to be a combination of data that you're um, buying, essentially, like third-party data vendors and data that you're producing yourself. So things that the sales reps are, are inputting into the system. And the trade-off for me is always, do we want a lot of data or do we want a small amount of data that's high quality? And those are like the big questions. A good example is on your opportunity object in Salesforce, if you want to get into the tactics. You know, you could ask a lot of questions. You can ask, you know, what was the competitor? What was the sales motion? You know, um, who were the partners involved? Like you could ask a hundred different questions, but the more questions you add, the less, the less, um, uh, the lower the quality gets. So uh, thinking through like, what are the data points that we can gather from the reps that are actually going to, u- we're actually going to use. So if that's competitive information, then, you know, make that really, uh, make those questions really seamless for them to answer and really focus on, on that. But every time you add more data, then you're going to, you're, you know, you're making a trade off there. Okay. I, I love what you said. So tell me if this is accurate. So is a mandate that you're trying to follow, try to automate everything and let the AEs or people do the least, because then not only is it less time, but more quality, you're assuming they're going to enter the right data. Is there something that is you're trying to follow, trying to enrich from different tools and other things into it, and then just let them do the things that only can come out of a conversation? That's the goal. Um, but, you know, there's always sort of the last mile, which is the data, like you said, you could only get from a conversation or from the sales reps actually mm-hmm. logging that information. We use multiple different data providers. Um, I know you're going to ask me about my my data horror stories and um, I can yeah, share course. some of the <laughs> I can share some of the challenges that that, that we have um, when it comes to trying to bring data from lots of data providers oh. together. You know, it's it's funny. I talk to a lot of people about not just data because I'm I'm a I'm a geek. That's who I am. I like to talk about data and orchestration and tying it all together. But but it's about decision making, right? I mean, at the end of the day, what defines data as a critical piece? The data itself is not the solution, right? It's what business objective it serves. Correct. So it's about decision making, reporting, analytics, making transparency of the data. Um, I'd love to hear I mean, like the horror stories about like tying, trying to get to this um, state of good data. Tell us a little bit. That's always a, one of the highlights of this show. Tell us a good story. Yeah, sure. I mean, before I get there, I'll, you know, you mentioned the it's about decisions and it's, it's actually a good, this is a good example of this. Like um, at MongoDB, our approach, you know, we have this open source database, right? And anybody can use it for free, either our open source version or um, our cloud sure. version. They can sign up and create an account for MongoDB Atlas and start using um you know, MongoDB, either the free version or they can swipe a credit card and pay as they go. Um, So we have this massive community of developers that are using MongoDB. And we try to focus the reps on where there's what we call smoke, as in when there's where there's smoke, there's fire. What are the accounts where we already have developer engagement? Those are going to be a much easier sale than going to someone and saying, hey, why don't you replace your Oracle database with MongoDB? Um, So the challenge that we have is that we have a massive market. Database market, something like $70 billion market. We have a huge developer community. So the challenge is where do we go first? Which accounts do we target? What are the highest propensity accounts for us to target? Because, you know, we could waste a lot of time um, on a very sort of slow moving um, uh, company where there's other companies that are much warmer that have already sort of engaged with MongoDB in some way. So like one of the decisions that we've had to make when it comes to the data in our systems is, do we have the full market? Do we try to get every single company that's building software applications? Do we try to capture that in our CRM? Because we want to have the full sort of um, possible 
um, set of accounts? Or do we say, hey, we want to have a smaller subset of accounts. We're not going to have everything, but we're going to have higher quality data, data on those uh, accounts. And that's sort of an evolution we're moving towards. We're actually moving towards fewer accounts, higher quality. And largely that has to do with the challenge of um, when you have so many accounts and so many subsidiaries, it becomes harder and harder to enrich those accounts with the third-party data providers. And more and more of those signals that we're getting in order to decide which accounts to target from a sales perspective they come from our own internal signals like marketing and the product sure. itself, like when people sign up for the free tier or even pay with a credit card. But they also come from third-party providers like, does the person have a MongoDB job listing? Are they listing MongoDB as a skill on their LinkedIn profile? Um, do we have technographic data from some of these third-party providers? So pulling all that data together into, um, into one sort of single um, single source of truth has been one of the biggest, you know, it's, it's an ongoing data initiative. We actually were working with our engineering team to automate some of the connection of those data points, but we've also built out a data governance team um, out of our India office, and they're responsible for merging, purging, and reviewing all of the account data. So that's kind of my data horror story, and it's kind of ongoing. <laughs> it's a never-ending horror story, always there for you. Yes. Um, I, I love what you're saying. It's um. I call it account-based everything because I'm tired of calling it ABM because it's not just on my marketing. But it seems like you are moving to a one-to-few approach where you want the quality one-to-few like subset of your ICP versus your, your entire TAM is in your database, which it doesn't always make sense because there's so many changes in signals and collection. Leave those for inbound, but also but for like outbound and higher quality, you want to make sure that the one-to-few or the thousands, not the millions, of companies you have much more data on and uh, and today I'm, I'm i would like to understand like are you trying to get mostly um third party and first party and some of course data and aggregated but is it something that the reps and the people that are actually in see and have an ability to prioritize from that or is it always automated and you tell them here's number one here's number three where is the decision making for the individual territory come in how flexible is it it, it, that's a great question. So all of our sellers follow a named account model. So mm -hmm. everybody, ha we don't have any large geographic patches. It's, sure. So in that way, we are sort of following the, the account-based go-to-market uh, approach, right? Where where reps will have a portfolio of accounts versus a um, versus sort of a spray and pray kind of model. So that enables them to be more targeted in their outreach. Um, it's it's different depending on whether we're talking about our inside sales team, which we call our corporate team versus our enterprise sales team. In the enterprise world, we have reps that have anywhere between, some reps have as few as one account and other reps have more like 15 or 20 accounts. Sure. And that's very much based on the skill set of the rep, the opportunity in the account. And it's much more of a, it's a decision that the sales manager ultimately makes with input from sales operations and the, and the data that we're able to provide them. And it's a little bit more of an art than a science, right? Because you wouldn't necessarily put in a, an up, up and coming rep on a very complex financial services account, right? So sure. there's really no way to automate that. Now on our inside sales team, it's much more high velocity, much more transactional, and we give them larger territories. So let's say 40 or 50 accounts. And those, that's where sales ops actually plays even more of a role where it's, it's very data driven. It's like, Hey, this is an account where we see they have, you know, 10 MongoDB developers. They're hiring for MongoDB, uh, somebody with MongoDB skills. They've got three Atlas free tiers. We should have someone call them. Right. And so we try to balance out those signals across those inside sellers roles but it's less, there's less of that sort of matching of this skill set that you would necessarily, you would need in the higher end of the market. Sure. Yeah. Some, some people call it tactical, but it's not. They're all strategic. Every company, every sale is strategic. So it's just more, um, the more automation and more decision making at the automation layer, but rather at the looking at so much complex data and trying to understand it as a rep, should I go for this account, which persona and so forth. It's always the one interesting piece of one-to-one -one or enterprise or strategic, whatever you call it. There's so many moving parts. You can't just capture them all in a report because there's a lot of like talking to a person, understanding them, relationships and all that. Uh, if we had a great way to capture that maybe one day, um, which leads me to obviously the, the one thing that we always try to strive towards, which is what would this data Vana be to you? The Nirvana state of data. <laughs> if you could like imagine it, think you are now minority report style, could do anything with your fingers. 
anything is possible, no limitations of technology or orchestration of data. What would that state be for you and why? Well, I think the end goal for me and the data I'm always trying to get at is what, what does excellence look like? What does excellence look like in a given account? So like, what are the best opportunities? What does excellence look like in a given rep? So I always am trying at the, my end state is to try to match the best account with the best reps, right? And understanding that the, um, the characteristics of those things. So for me, like data nirvana, whatever you want to call it, uh, data nirvana is all about um, easily being able to identify um, and, and sort of get to the, the, the best of those two things, really. And, and that takes probably, that's cool. I like it. It's a different approach. Because usually if we think about nirvana, it's like, okay, I can make any decision anytime I want of all the data to support me. But this matchmaking is a challenge because some of the data is a little bit like more historic, like has this rep successfully been uh, better at accounts that have, are in this specific um, sector, segment, size, those are, are easier, but have they, if, if the account has been engaged twice and dropped off for six months, have they traditionally been better at that versus a brand new cold account? Like this unlimited set of data and signals that you can look at, it's not unlimited, obviously it's finite, but but it sounds like a lot. And, and that goes back to the question that I think you raised, what I'm thinking about is like, how much data do you look at? Or is it like data analysis paralysis that leads to no decision? <laughs> That's, it's, it's a, or, or is it a data science team that you give these questions to and they go break their head? Do you guys have that function? Um, not within my team. We do have some data scientists within our centralized um, analytics team. And I think there are some interesting uh, things that we could be doing um, in terms of taking advantage of um, uh, some more sophisticated analytics. Um, you know, I hesitate to admit this, but like, really, I think the first thing is getting high quality data because those kinds of analyses are only as good as the underlying data. And sure. like I mentioned, that's an area where I think we're, we're trying to make improvements. And from talking to my peers, like everybody has these kinds of challenges. But when I think about um, like this sort of idea of like a, an amazing end state would be using that kind of sophisticated analysis to match the best rep, identify who the best reps are and match them to the best accounts or the best accounts for their skill set. Like that to me, like if somebody wants to fund a startup that will do that, I would definitely buy it. Yeah, we have a headline out of this podcast. If you can match make, not just between people, but between people and accounts, there we go. You got, it actually is because then you're giving us the end state of what is likely to have a much better result. And then your coverage model can we go, be a bit more softer. And then you're more relaxed on forecasting, and then you know you can commit better and so forth. It's an interesting one. Um, tell me a little bit about reporting and 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 where do you sit, and what do you think of the terminology of RevOps, and where should it report to? I'm always curious to hear people's thoughts about what does RevOps mean to you. Sure. So I have a little bit of a contrarian view on RevOps. Love um, it. Let's bring it. All right. Fun yeah. time. So I, I think um, so. At MongoDB, we have the quote unquote, siloed approach, right? We have a marketing ops and a, um, a customer success ops and a sales ops team. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think there's pros and cons to RevOps. So I think RevOps works well when you're, if you're earlier stage and you don't, you know, already have established teams for one, I think it can certainly help cut through some of the um, debates. I mean, I know, for example, I've been in many conversations with my counterparts in finance or marketing ops or customer success ops and we're looking at one metric in slightly different ways. Um, so, and then I think there's also like a career trajectory benefit to RevOps, right? Like people can um, potentially move into new roles across supporting different uh, parts of the go-to-market. My contrarian point of view is that, um, I don't know about you, but I've never liked working with large centralized functions because they tend to be slower moving and um, less aligned to the business units that they support. So one of the things I like about running sales operations and is actually that I'm in sales and I report to the CRO and I have really deep relationships with the sales leadership and I understand their, their pains and the things that they need to do. And I can move more quickly to address those. And I potentially could if I were part of, part of a centralized, if we had a centralized function. So I, I'm not saying it's RevOps is bad. I just think like, um, I, there's something to be said for the, um, you know, sort of smaller, more agile teams within the individual business units. 
I think that's a great point. I think we should uh, continue on it. It's a, it's about stage, maturity of the company, and about prioritization and an ability to execute the things that are most important to the line leader or the function. So, for example, if it's about tooling and technology, do you think those should always sit within the functional owners versus analytics centralized view? Is there a place for it to be centralized so that everybody agrees on metrics? Um, I mean, like, it, again, it's dependent. At MongoDB, we have an analytics function within sales, and there are certain ways that we look at things um, that are very sales specific. Um, the way we measure productivity, the way we look at the leading indicators of success. I mentioned metrics for success, um, the way we think about how we segment, uh, how we assign accounts, how we develop comp plans, how we set quotas. Those are all very sales specific type of metrics. And I, I question whether a centralized group could take on all of that. Now, there's there's certainly other metrics that maybe it would make sense to sit in a centralized group, but there's enough meat there just in sales um, yeah, that justifies. you I think you having a, spe- a specialist team helps. On the technology side, I think it's similar. Like you know, we have a joint ownership of Salesforce with our um, IT team, and they're responsible. That team is responsible for all the parts of Salesforce that connect with the finance systems and the HR systems. So whether it's exactly or Netsuite or those other tools, we're responsible for all the things that are facing sales. So whether it's you know Clary or Chorus or Inside View or any of those other data enrichment tools. So um, uh, and I think there is a benefit to having those. Um, uh, functional experts um, managing the tools and the analytics. Sure, yeah, I, I see where you're going. It's a the, the last thing that I always want as a CMO is to be dependent on a function that doesn't report to me, but is accountable to my priorities. It's very difficult from a political organization perspective, and it's not great. And even though maybe it's a centralized budget, which helps because then you say, should we as a company? decide X versus Y, it's easier to make the decision if it's centralized. It is harder to accomplish things and you have to fight for priorities and time. And perhaps it is a smaller scale uh, place. At different companies, we had the challenge of connecting the silos between different ops groups. But all you need is just to have people really sit together, agree on structures, agree on frameworks, and that's all it is. Both have worked. RevOps is a new thing. The world survived without RevOps for a while, right? (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I, there, I do think there are benefits. Like, I think, um, like one of the observations, like, you know, we could probably be consolidating some of our tools. Um, you know, maybe maybe there would be some ways to streamline some of the analytics. So, uh, I do think that there there are benefits um, to RevOps, but I I think, um, like I said, I have a little bit of a contrarian point of view because um, um, from where I sit, I'm able to just move a lot faster, being more embedded in the business that I support. Sure. Okay, that's good. I love talking about RevOps and all these topics. Everybody looks at it differently. There is no one playbook. You are at a hundred million ARR, you're SaaS or you're not, you're enterprise, you have to have RevOps. No, you just, however you make it work and scale, that's what's the most important. And and I love those uh, elements. It's really cool. One uh, last thing that we do on the show is we want to ask always our wonderful guests a little bit about like the art of the possible again. If you come to either the COO or the CFO or the CRO, or even your CEO, if you could tell, not yours, but others in the world, what would you tell them something that would really be able to guide them that people are sometimes a little bit uncomfortable saying, like, for example, you got to go have great coverage because that helps you make your numbers. What would be like your tip or guideline to them to make them more successful that sometimes they neglect? Well, from the top, there has to be buy-in on the quality of the data. So we talked earlier about the trade-off between quantity and quality. And in my experience, the only way you get better quality is if leadership is, is actually inspecting and looking at that data. And so um, if you want to have, if you want a competitive analysis six months from now, then you got to get the reps to input that data yeah. uh, on those opportunities. And that message, like, you know, as much as I can bang the drum to like add this data to Salesforce or capture that data, it's much more effective when it comes from the head of sales or the CEO. So they should be thinking about, you know, um, you know, what data do they want want to collect and how are they going to inspect it and look at it on a daily basis? Because if you think about it, all the reports that we look at regularly, those that's where the data is the highest quality because people 
look at it and they say that data looks wrong, we need to fix it. So um, a lot of that has to come from the top. And I don't think, uh, I think the, the senior leaders that realize that end up getting higher quality data. Love it. I think, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's like always looking at the polls. Okay, let's dive into this one. Click on that one. And now on Zoom, we do this. Wait, why is this? This is wrong. No, it's attribution is incorrect. Like the hours of my life that I've spent <laughs> in these kind of conversations and meetings and rooms. Yeah, it's... Uh, Data governance, I, I truly second, is an extremely important thing. If you want to have competitive intelligence and analysis, well, if you need the data there, you need a drop down of like, okay, it's like we lost a competitor and then like, what's the reason? Well, or like win loss uh, analysis, right? If you don't capture it, how are you going to know? It's, you can't just go do a survey to your AEs six months later because they probably forgot, right? Yeah, I strongly, <laughs> yeah. I strongly agree with you, but having the data is extremely important in order to analyze it. Otherwise, good luck. Yeah. And, and that's usually what I advise people who are at an earlier stage is, you know, a lot of times in the early stage, I mean, because I've been at MongoDB, you know, 11 years, when I joined, we had no sales force, nothing, right? <laughs> we, had, we, we signed our first customer like a few months after I joined. So, um, but thinking even at that stage, like, what is the data I want to collect? Because you can't make database decisions in the very early phase, but you're going to want to be able to make those decisions later. So setting up your systems to capture that information is really important. Same thing. And when I was in marketing, like capturing all of the campaign data on our first marketing programs so that, you know, in a few years when we had a little bit of data, we could actually look back and see what was, was effective, but you had to have set up that infrastructure from the get go so that you could run those kinds of analyses. Definitely. The, the structure of data, the structure of your program, aligning all of these tools and orchestrating it across its without that you're just going to have silo data that doesn't actually give you a solution and that's good luck connecting all the dots there that's a big effort big project you have mind to bring somebody from the outside to do yeah right but i think the other key thing you mentioned is like you know looking at the reports it's like if you can kind of narrow it down to like these are the key dashboards and reports we're going to look at and we're actually going to look at them on a regular basis um that's when you can actually start getting and and you're all looking at the same set of metrics consistently like you know mongodb we look at sales productivity it's like a key metric for us sure so everybody understands it we're all tracking it quarter over quarter we use the same um uh reports to look at it um so it's not like a surprise when we look at that that data set and that data set tends to be very high quality as a result this is definitely example. oh definitely love it i mean aligning on a ceo dashboard or the, the top five kpis or six kpis the CRO and the CMO, number one, number two, number three KPIs that we look at, and we all agree, this is the data, this is what it means, and now we look at it month over month, quarter over quarter, doesn't really matter, then we can have insightful discussions and conversations about what the hell the data is telling us to do versus questioning the data. I would love it. I think for me, a lot of times, data vana is, let's have data we trust and stop talking about the data, but start yeah. talking about the takeaways and what the data is telling us. If we could balance that to 80-20, I will take that any day, right? No, I, I, I totally agree. I think that's one of the biggest challenges when you're in these data roles is um, you, it's so easy to get into a rabbit hole that looks that data looks wrong. And a lot of times, you know, like that's, that's the people who are looking at the data, they, the business people, the sales people, they understand it. So they're, they're, if they're surprised to see the data, a lot of times their intuition is right. So trying to anticipate that and make sure that the the conversation isn't about is the data right or not and is about what are the yeah. conclusions we can draw from that data. Um, you know, that takes, um, th that's that's like a, a much better place to be in. Excellent. Well, Megan Gill, this has been delightful. We know that data is the thing that makes the world go round, or not that much, but helps us in many things. Um, I appreciate you coming on the show. I think... Uh, the Nirvana state of data to make us actually match make people and accounts is an extremely good takeaway that I'm going to think about a bit now. <laughs> Thanks for having me. All right.